I'm very happy to start this day um, where we're going to be sharing a lot of stories from the global community around DHIS2 and the global COVID-19 response. So I'll, I'll get things kicked off with a small presentation around how we've achieved speed and scale through our global goods and local innovation. And then most of today will be dedicated to our various implementers in our global community to share their stories. So a couple snapshots here, um, but today I'm just very happy to um, be able to share. And I'm having a little trouble with the uh, changing of the slides. Okay, so our global deployment of, of DHIS2. So to open today, I will talk just a bit about our global goods and also around our local innovation. And so this is built around a, a long history and the foundations that we have built as a community over the course of many years. Um, then I will go into a little bit about how we have highlighted the local innovations that are at the very heart of how we have worked for decades and looking at a persistent focus on meeting the needs of end users in countries. So looking at district level, national users, but also where health services are delivered in facilities and communities. So this first slide, it really um, is intended to just highlight what we consider to be our global public goods. So there is the DHIS2 platform itself. Uh, the DHIS2 Android Capture app that has fast-tracked minor releases and critical support for the um, global deployment. We have our COVID-19 metadata packages. So this is a part of a body of work with the health organization around taking global standards and developing DHIS2 products to help disseminate those standards. And last but not least, uh, we also have our DHIS2 Academy curriculum. And that includes end user training templates, um, remote training support, and moving a lot of these in-person academies into online webinars and academies. So a lot of innovation in how we continue to support countries during the time of no travel. So taking a bit of a step back, um, not as far as the birth of DHIS2, but at least back to 2014, we had a lot of learning from the Ebola outbreak response in West Africa, and I believe it was the Ministry of Health in Liberia who first contacted UIO to send a delegation to the country to see how they could support the use of DHIS2. So this was the system that was already being used in country and many users were familiar with it. And we also learned that even with the health system under duress in several of these countries during the Ebola outbreak, reporting into DHIS2 was sustained, so we still had access to data through an established system. So what we've learned is that we need to be strengthening existing systems when these crises happen. We shouldn't be introducing parallel systems. Um, we know that we need flexibility to facilitate these rapid transitions between detailed case-based surveillance um, and line listings when the outbreaks start to happen. And then also being able to move to aggregated daily data collection when the burden is just too heavy. Uh, we know that we need simplicity, collecting only the data that is needed to ensure that we have good quality data to be used, and that we're not overburdening the healthcare workers from their real task, which is providing the healthcare and the response. Um, we know there's a lot of work to do around decentralization, so distributing the workload to subnational levels, to facilities, and even to community health workers. And these are the people who are really the source of data when it comes to early warning. We've learned a lot about data standards, the extent to which we can preset pre these and be able to disseminate these so that we can mitigate the proliferation of tools in the field and also be thinking about data exchange principles long before there is an urgent need. And lastly, we've learned a lot about making sustainable gains. So using these emergencies to step up surveillance capacities. So not just being able to respond to Ebola, but to be able to respond to the next emergency outbreak. So we'll hear from Sierra Leone today. They have really honed their experience in disease surveillance and over four years, they've been scaling decentralized case-based reporting. And they've recently introduced DHIS2 as a national electronic uh, case-based disease surveillance system. It helped them to detect a Lassa fever outbreak in 2019 and it's being further leveraged now. So we have some really great stories around how countries who have made this happen. And lastly, this is also work that had sparked our first CDC partnership. 
to further develop DHIS2 and the software to be able to respond to the functionality that's needed for disease surveillance use cases. In 2016, the Health Data Collaborative was established. This was a response to the, um, to the development of the Sustainable Development Goals. So this platform aligns technical and financial resources. So many, many partners that we work with and others, Gavi, Global Fund, NORAD, uh, the Gates Foundation, um, they have really brought themselves together around a common framework for strengthening routine health information systems. So this gave us a global platform to align our resources and really be able to dedicate several years of work into helping countries to improve their own um, M&E systems for health and, and also being able to emphasize that, that national ownership of those systems. In 2017, the University of Oslo became a WHO collaborating center for innovation and implementation research on health information system strengthening. So we've partnered with the, uh, WHO for many, many years, um, but this gave us um, a place to work where we could expand upon the WHO health facility data toolkit and be able to develop these DHIS2 metadata packages. So it's like an extension of those WHO standards that can be installed into a country's local um, DHIS2 instance. So we're really looking at using DHIS2 as a platform for disseminating these types of data standards. Um, it crosses facility data, but also um, with linkages around civil reg registration and vital statistics, um, as well as integrating other types of data, um, mortality databases and population level data for better analysis. In 2018, we saw some major investments in malaria elimination systems. So the Gates Foundation launched the Digital Solutions for Malaria Elimination Project. And that helped expand the DHIS2 core platform, as well as the DHIS2 Android Capture app with new functionality that supports malaria elimination surveillance. And much of this functionality has now been repurposed for COVID-19. So many of these disease use cases, the software requirements are very similar. So we're looking at one screenshot here, which is um, some enhancements to relationship analytics that were built out to analyze um, the relationship of malaria cases with foci in an elimination context. But now we're able to, to reconceptualize and repurpose that functionality for COVID as well, using those same principles to be able to link uh, index cases with their contacts and with clusters of cases. So when we develop in a generic way, much of the functionality has, uh, has a life and a benefit beyond the specific uh, disease use case. We also have a screenshot here of the Android Capture app, and a lot of improvements have gone in here to the Android app to really help the operational activities among field workers and helping them to answer the question, what is it that I need to do today? Towards the end of 2019 in Athens, there was an advisory group convened with um, experts from WHO and CDC on surveillance, and they joined a delegation from the University of Oslo and our his partners. Um, and this entire week was uh, designed to really develop and understand the requirements for vaccine preventable disease surveillance. And so this work, um, we are working on vaccine preventable disease case-based metadata packages and aggregate IDSR packages, but these design prototypes actually became the foundation for our COVID-19 metadata packages. So we were able to pool on years of expertise and experience, and many of these designs have already experienced some field testing and some validation in countries like Sierra Leone and Uganda. Um, we will also have Dr. Alan Poy who will be sharing how the WHO African Regional Office has capitalized on this with many, many countries in Africa using DHIS2 already for the aggregate IDSR reporting and being able to implement a surveillance system at, at a regional platform level. So now we can skip forward to 2020, this very interesting year. Um, you will hear from Pamad next around Sri Lanka. Um, but I wanted to emphasize here that from January, Sri Lanka customized DHIS2 for COVID-19 surveillance. So there's this huge importance of having a global network of regional and in in-country expertise. And there are many countries who are able to move faster than we did at the global level to mobilize their systems for a COVID-19 response. Um, a few more that come to mind include Bangladesh and Indonesia, who were quickly able to update some of their aggregate daily reporting forms, as well as Myanmar, who was able to update an event-based patient registry to capture COVID cases very early on. 
So this type of uh, national capacity and ownership is critical to, to what we see as a successful response. Um, March 11th, 2020. So this is the day that we officially released our COVID-19 metadata packages. And this is quite interesting because we have our tracker implementers here, Sharajit and Yuri and Enzo, at the Ghana Tracker Implementation Academy in Accra during this time. So they were working day and night to develop the first version of the COVID-19 case-based surveillance tracker package. And um, it also gave us this possibility for real-time validation because we had several country teams at this academy bringing their critical insights from their own implementation experiences to help us understand if this design is something that matches what their experience shows about what works in the field. And so all of this happened uh, just as the academy was cut short and borders began to close. In April 2020, we saw the Norwegian Municipality Organization launch DHIS2 for contact tracing. So you'll hear a little more about this in one of the parallel sessions, um, but it just emphasizes that the challenges we face are not unique to low and middle income countries. Um, there's, very, there's a lot to be learned from the DC surveillance expertise across Africa and Asia and Latin America. So there's some really interesting use cases here at uh, municipality, a very um, more local level organizations who had switched from using Excel to DHIS2. And finally, here we are in September um, on a virtual conference because we can no longer meet in person, but you can see that 36 countries have now operationalized DHIS2 for COVID-19. And when I say operational, we mean that there's actually data actively being entered into the system for analysis and use. So I think, at least from my experience, this is one of the fastest scale-ups I've, I've really ever seen. And I think, uh, based on this presentation, you can see that it was really, this was built on years of collaborative work with our global community that helped us to respond. So now I'll switch gears just a bit to tell a little bit more about some of these uh, global goods. So there's the um, COVID-19 Digital Health Data Toolkit. So this was designed in a modular way. We have currently five different modules, uh, case-based surveillance and laboratory reporting. We have a points of entry screening and follow-up program, a contact tracing program that has relationships built in to those case-based surveillance. There's an outbreak line listing um, for when some of the case loads get too high to do proper decentralized case-based uh, surveillance. And then we also have daily reporting um, of cases of transmission status at subnational level and, and key resources. So we have designed with the idea that we should be optimizing data collection and field-based workflows at the bottom, but also we need to be having a da rapid data-driven response at the top. So being able to bring all of this data together in comprehensive dashboards to support the analysis and use. I'll talk a little bit more about what's actually in the toolkit. I think many of you have heard of the WHO metadata packages. So these are installable JSON files that contain all of the pre-configured metadata. And the idea is that every country doesn't need to start from scratch and redesign DHIS2. We can provide a bit of a template and we can match that template to what the global standards are. And in this case, this was all aligned to the WHO COVID-19 um, guidance, the technical guidance that was published uh, publicly. So at that point, a country can take this package, they install it in their own national instance, um, but then they're able to adapt it to their own use cases. So it's a bit of an accelerator that way. Um, in the interest of data exchange, we've included coded mechanisms for the WHO case-based data dictionary, and we are looking at um, SNOMED, uh, global patient data set codes being incorporated in the future. We also supplement this with documentation. So detailed installation guides, how do I actually get this into my instance? Um, system design guides that tell you how did we make certain design decisions um, based on the technical guidance we had and what we know about um, design practices. And, and finally, all of this, we need to be able to find new ways to, to train users in the field, particularly with travel restricted. So we've been working with a lot of these end user training templates to make it a little more ready to go. And I know many of our countries have been supporting um, virtual trainings down to facility and district level. And these are also developed in collaboration with our regional HISP groups. So we have a lot of um, field-based knowledge being input into these products. So these packages, as I've mentioned, the, the whole point of collecting data is be able to use the data. So we really want to emphasize having data at the fingertips of decision makers. So all of our packages come with uh, DHIS2 dashboards out of the box. 
um, to the best extent possible. They are being updated for emerging COVID analysis practices and, and new KPIs, particularly on contact tracing that are coming on board. But we've also looked at expanding existing WHO health data toolkits for DHIS2. So for example, we've had a cause of death package for a while that supports the WHO SMOL codes to be able to support countries in better capturing the medical certificate cause of death data. But we've also expanded this with some prototypes for rapid mortality surveillance. So where it can be very difficult to capture cause of death in the community, uh, we have a more simple prototype that allows capturing um, all cause death and being able to do uh, key analyses around excess death, particularly when we know that it's very hard to get good numbers about um, what deaths are truly attributable to COVID-19. Um, we're looking at the expansion of non-communicable disease registries and trackers with WHO and others. And these will become really critical um, as the analysis of comorbidities and really understanding what are the vulnerabilities in different populations are as you plan COVID response. And lastly, we have some really great sessions around secondary impact monitoring. So this is around measuring COVID-19 impact on health service delivery. So we know that COVID-19 cases and deaths are not the only ones affected. There are many people who are not receiving the key health services they need. So Global Fund and UNICEF, and uh, even at country level, have begun to explore some frameworks about where we can use this very robust HMIS data that has been supported and strengthened over many years. It provides us a baseline for doing these types of analyses. The last little piece of my presentation is, is going to be uh, the focus on local innovation. So I had told you we were able to achieve uh, scale rapidly around using these global products where I've showed you, but also being able to really tap into a very long tradition of the University of Oslo through action research. So again, this is the idea of being able to learn by doing. And we develop a global product. So say that is the, the DHIS2 software release. But then through local use, we're understanding how our country is adapting this and what are the new requirements that they need. And in the perspective of COVID-19, what are those new emerging requirements as, as people are really testing out this platform for new use cases? And it's this virtuous cycle of, of global standards coming top down and local innovation and best practices moving up that helps us to really develop a product that's going to meet the needs of our end users. So I'm going to share a couple examples here around how our national and regional experts have expanded and innovated on the DHIS2 platform, but these are really just teasers for some of the other sessions today that I hope you'll be able um, to participate and learn more. So you have a snapshot here on, uh, this is a custom dashboard that was developed through web apps. Um, DHIS2 has really invested in, in leveraging itself as a platform and making the app framework as a way for, for countries and implementers to be able to innovate more easily on top of the core software. So here we have a custom dashboard used by the Lao PDR epidemiologists and in their emergency operations center for being able to analyze more quickly the relationships between index cases and contacts and where those cases are moving around the country. I think one of the most interesting aspects from the global package was the wide adoption of points of entry screening. So we've talked about case-based surveillance for many years, a little less emphasis on points of entry, but this has really taken off with incredible innovative examples from Sri Lanka, um, from Uganda using Android apps and travel passes at the land borders, um, from Guinea-Bissau generating travel passes based on validated uh, laboratory surveillance data. So this is really fascinating and it shows a bit of an ability to be able to, to cross sectors because points of entry, they are generally not controlled by ministries of health. Um, so we are seeing sectors work together and bring data together in a way that, that um, we haven't really seen before. For many, many years, the ability to link case data with laboratory data, so laboratory data coming from one source, case data coming from more of um, clinical points of diagnosis, this, it's a challenge to link this data, not only in uh, low and middle income countries, but also in Western countries like the US. So we've seen some very interesting um, solutions that really support complex workflows, and they really are complex workflows. So we have some presentations from Rwanda Ministry of Health 
and from His Mozambique in Guinea-Bissau, how they've developed some tools to be able to bring these different data sets together. And last but not least, um, we've seen the importance of getting data out of DHIS2. So data from DHIS2, it's a source for national program planners for the national response teams, but also we need to be able to support risk communication to the public. And so increasingly we are seeing solutions and innovation around how to better get that data out of DHIS2 and, and put it out there for communities and the public to, to understand and feel confident and feel some transparency with, with what's happening with the epidemic situation in their country and locally. So I, I will stop here just with a small reflection. Um, after the Ebola crisis, so there were ministries of health and finance um, in Ebola affected countries in West and Central Africa. They convened in Geneva and the Lancet wrote, the lesson painfully learned shows that we don't need another vertical program for a specific health condition or challenge. What we need is to build resilient health systems. So I've summarized a bit of our roadmap this year, um, but what I'd really like to emphasize is that we are very much on a pathway forward together. And when we close with a plenary session at the end of the day, uh, Gavi and Global Fund and CDC will join us to share some perspectives um, as global partners around how we can work together to really build resilient health systems and to be able to know that when the next emerging disease X appears that we're going to be ready for it. And so with that, I thank you very much for letting me open the day. And I'm very pleased to hand it over to my colleague, Pamad Amarakun, who will share uh, the experiences, the pioneering experiences from Sri Lanka in developing DHIS2 for the COVID-19 response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone from uh, wherever you are joining. I'm Pamo Damrakun representing HISP Sri Lanka, and I'll be talking briefly about uh, COVID-19 health response um, with experience from Sri Lanka. So uh, let me just start with uh, some background about history. Uh, we are all aware that uh, COVID-19 started off uh, somewhere in late December. In fact, on 31st December, China reported its uh, first cluster of COVID-19. And then uh, with regard to Sri Lankan context, it was not about whether we would get COVID-19, but we were more worried about when we were going to get it because uh, we had uh, so many Chinese tourists and employees who, are, who were working in Sri Lanka, and we were not sure like uh, when we would be getting this disease into uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, through one of the tourists who are entering the country. So in fact, uh, Sri Lanka got uh, its first case of COVID-19 on 27th January. And uh, interestingly, by the time we got uh, the first case of COVID-19, we had already thought about what to do with regard to information collection and surveillance on COVID-19. So how it all started was on 20th January, 2020. So on 20th January, so about one week before we got uh, the first case of COVID-19, we had an initial discussion with the Ministry of Health Sri Lanka. So what did they ask? So they had few specific concerns about setting up an information system because the main issue was that we did not have an integrated disease surveillance system, a digital one, which connects uh, various institutes of, uh, under the Ministry of Health as well as other stakeholders such as immigration department, the ports of entry. So one major issue they, they had was to share this information that is coming uh, with different stakeholders. So these stakeholders include Ministry of Health stakeholders as well as non-Ministry of Health stakeholders, such as uh, uh, those who are there at the ports of entry. And then whatever it is, like uh, we were certain that we are going to get this disease in like a uh, few days, probably. So they wanted uh, something to be developed really fast. Uh, not about weeks, so usually it takes weeks, but uh, this was to be developed in few days. And then, uh, of course, uh, usually the ministry procurement process, even when it comes to an uh, information system, it's a really lengthy process, but they did not want to uh, uh, get, get that process involved, but rather it had to be, you know, like a really fast procurement or establishment of the system in the uh, ministry uh, setting itself. 
And then, of course, uh, they, they were not sure because nobody, nobody was uh, sure. Like we are talking about early January. Uh, no one really knew how the disease was progressing and which, I mean, like uh, what, when you consider about a country, uh, what's the uh, scale it will be affecting. So they were not sure where we are going to implement the system. So they, what they only knew was like we may start with few facilities, but we may need, uh, really need to scale it up as time passes. And then, of course, uh, the scope of requirements, we were not sure. I mean, it could have, uh, it could change rapidly. So you can't go for a detailed SRS uh, at the time of, you know, designing the system, but uh, it has to be agile that uh, there will be requirements that are changing and we had to incorporate uh, modules uh, even after the system has been uh, set up and is functioning. And then because we had so many stakeholders joining uh, and entering data, sharing data, weaving data, they wanted some sort of access control so that uh, say, for example, a particular department, they will only have access to a particular set of uh, analytics or data. And of course, like uh, the training, because now it was COVID-19, we could not get people gathered at uh, training centers. So the training was one major issue. So they preferred a platform where the health staff was already having some experience. So the training, uh, the, the learning curve of the system was not that great. And of course, there were some concerns whether uh, they would prefer to have some mobile data entry as opposed to entering data from a laptop or computer. And also uh, to integrate with the existing information system because like already they knew like we had to start off with somewhere uh, about the port of entry, uh, the airport. So that itself had uh, its own information system. So there was scope for integration as well. So, uh, I mean, after the discussion, looking at all these requirements, what we felt was DHIS2 was the ideal candidate, even though at that time, talking about third week of January, this uh, was not tested anywhere in the world. But then again, um, we uh, took on the task and in like three days, we were able to get the first version piloted. And in fact, what you're seeing now is, uh, is an extract from one of the popular newspapers in Sri Lanka, where the Director General of Health Service uh, informs the parliament that this kind of system has been set up and uh, we have piloted in and it's ready for implementation uh, at the ports of entry. So uh, in fact, like there was so much of support from the ministry administrators all the way up to the Director General of Health Services in getting fast approval for the implementation of this system. Mm -hmm. And then um, about the, uh, the community. Right, so uh, this, as you can see, is a screenshot uh, of, from the DHS to Slack. In fact, this was on 29th January. So uh, this was, in fact, my official, the first official communication with the DHS to community. So what I did was uh, after having uh, the first pilot, I mean, so we, we were ready uh, at around 25th January, I informed uh, the community about what we have done in Sri Lanka and that we have uh, launched it. So as you can see here, uh, it was that time, it was novel coronavirus, it was not COVID-19, this is January. So with this uh, uh, communication, of course, I received so much of uh, feedback from the DHS to community, from the University of Oslo especially, and even from uh, other his notes as well as the community. Right. So uh, about the functionality of what we developed, so it was mostly about customizing DHIS2. So initially the first version, it was about the port of entry, which was just a DHIS2 simple customization. But the thing was, it was getting more and more complex because there were so many uh, user requests that we had to cater because uh, of the urgency of the situation where we had to think of some custom development. So this custom development was, was required for certain functionalities, which was not possible by using core DHIS2 applications. Sometimes there were like the customizations we have already done, which also required some kind of uh, development on top of it. This was where uh, in around mid-March, we had a hackathon developed and uh, so many freelance developers, Sri Lankans who were joining from Sri Lanka as well as uh, outside were gathered along with all these stakeholders mentioned, including the government ICT agency who did a major task, as well as uh, the University of Oslo who provided support and guidance all throughout this process. So more about this hackathon and the local innovations in, uh, in the symposium that we are having on local innovations. Uh, but, but we had the customization plus the, the development component also, uh, which ran parallelly. So what you're seeing here is the entire ecosystem of the modules that we had, uh, that we have in our uh, COVID-19 surveillance system. So uh, the first uh, component that was developed, of course, was the point of entry program. This was very simple initially, where we wanted uh, uh, all the tourists who were entering the country 
registered there and that data to be available to the field health staff so that they can perform a visit while they are in the country uh, within the next 14 days. But then again, uh, uh, it was always changing. The requirements were changing. So by, by about uh, uh, first or second week of March, the country, country's policy changed and they mandated everyone who was entering the country should go for mandatory quarantine. So everyone was put on government quarantine centers. So this was when uh, they wanted uh, the system to be customized so that all quarantine patients or persons information should also be there in the system along with what's, uh, I mean, their, their, their symptoms and the tests they have undergone. So this is where the quarantine health uh, uh, center information also, module also came into the system. And thereafter, of course, uh, by about the uh, uh, third week of March, we had a huge rise of cases. So this was when uh, they wanted to have the case information also integrated into the system and the suspect information. And then uh, uh, also to uh, go along with this, they wanted different kind of mappings about case to uh, suspects. So uh, these components also had to be developed in addition to the routine uh, laboratory and uh, the hospital information that they required from the cases. And then, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's the same in almost all the countries uh, because of the enthusiasm. A lot of people try to contribute uh, to the ecosystem of information in COVID-19. So there were so many uh, third party applications, mobile applications that were coming up. So uh, the government also required, the ministry also required some kind of support to integrate uh, the information that is coming from these third party solutions into the system. So we had to work on that, uh, that part as well. And then uh, once we started seeing a, a, a sudden rising uh, cases as well as the, uh, the deaths, they were more concerned about having uh, an idea about the ICU beds, the level of ICU beds. So this was when the ICU bed monitoring uh, another custom application was developed. And then we had uh, requirements about, uh, you know, like uh, some, some barriers about uh, taking too much time to enter data. So this was when other integrations such as integrating with the immigration system was required on top of all already existing functioning uh, modules. So I just wanted to briefly highlight, it's not, not about just one module that was there in the system, but, there, but it was catering a wide range of requirements. And what you're seeing is the timeline of uh, how these modules were developed uh, along with the, how the uh, COVID-19 progressed in the country. And but you may be able to see that uh, from late January, and by about the late April, within that three months time, we were able to get all these uh, modules developed as well as share it back with the community. So what you're seeing here is a contact mapping visualization, which is of course a custom application, custom web application we developed based on the requirements because the core DHS2 uh, system does not support this kind of visualization where you wanted to see how this is progress from a, which, uh, from a confirmed case to suspect. So this mapping was required and this was done, uh, this was made in fact uh, as, as an output uh, from the hackathon we had. So more about this uh, in the next symposium. But uh, what I wanted to highlight is that uh, this local innovation about the contact mapping visualization, we shared it with the community and the University of Oslo uh, took it up and identified the generic requirements and uh, with the help of their uh, University of Oslo developers as well as uh, local developers, we were able to uh, come up with, the, with this generic contact tracing application, which was then released in the DHIS2 App Store. So this was in fact uh, contributing back to the community. And then again, uh, we further expanded the contact tracing uh, application by like they wanted to check uh, uh, the, uh, where the persons, if, if, if someone is confirmed, they wanted to check where this person has visited in the last two weeks. So for that one, we, they wanted to take uh, data from uh, mobile tower, of course, with the consent from, uh, from the patient as well as with government authority. So there was the integration component that, that was developed, which kind of pulls data from this uh, mobile network information uh, to the DHS2, which shows where uh, the person has traveled in the last two weeks. So this was again, another custom development we did uh, on top of the contact tracing model. And then again, this is the ICU bed tracking, which is in fact a very simple uh, uh, tracker implementation, but due to the uh, prevailing situation where they required some custom visualizations and very simple interfaces, we had to develop this uh, ICU bed tracking simple web application uh, within like two weeks time. So uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, uh, in this entire procedure. 
the thing is like uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge we had was uh, uncertainty of requirements because we were not sure. We, we never thought that we had to incorporate all these modules when we first developed the uh, initial version with the port of entry program in uh, late January. But now when you look at the system, it has uh, about six or seven components and some of them are even custom made. So the requirements were always changing and we had to be agile to the change in requirements. And then uh, sometimes uh, because uh, the health staff was too much burdened with data entry and even at the ports of entry, they had other uh, tasks to attend to. So we could not uh, allocate too much of time for the data entry. So for that one, uh, there had to be some solution. And then again, uh, there are a lot of other requirements that were coming, which were not possible using the DHS2 core applications. This was also a challenge we had uh, during the initial period. And uh, the biggest task, one of the biggest tasks was training of end users. Because not only, uh, I mean, the, the, the other biggest challenge with the uh, COVID-19 was that uh, mobility of everyone was limited. So we could not bring health staff to usual training centers that we were used to do. So we had to explore uh, other means of training. And that was a major task uh, in the first couple of months. And then again, there were a lot of uh, uh, applications, third party applications. There were a lot of mushrooming of applications, but some of them, they really had uh, a, a, a lot of uh, uh, good things about them and we had to uh, integrate with them so that there has to be uh, some kind of data sharing. So we had to think about integrations. And then the strategies, a lot of them. The first strategy, of course, was uh, using the DHS to itself because it was a customizable platform. Had we gone for a uh, custom made third party software uh, with all these changing requirement, it would have been a nightmare. So it was one of the best decisions that we took uh, early uh, in, the, uh, in the early days of COVID-19. And then we had to integrate with existing information systems in the government sector, such as, for example, we had the uh, uh, immigration system, which already had passenger information there uh, before uh, the, the flight uh, landed in, in, uh, uh, in, in Sri Lanka. So that information we had to push to the DHS to instance so that uh, they only had to enter data about uh, uh, the health conditions. And then again, of course, uh, what we did was we designed a few web applications, of course, uh, with the concurrence of University of Oslo, because like the thing was, uh, there was too much of expertise required for a totally new set of developers. And uh, without their support, of course, this would not have been possible. Uh, but with this web application, we were able to uh, quickly address the issues that were not possible with four DHS2 applications. And then we had to support third party uh, solutions. And also uh, we had to think about, the country had to think about the roadmap for the personal health application. So there were some discussions uh, about, uh, about the country's information system as well. Now that uh, the country is even thinking about going for a central HMIS, which gets this all uh, uh, the vital indicators from all the programs so that dashboards are visible, which we didn't have it before. And then uh, of course the training. So we used uh, so, uh, so many technologies, especially the Zoom. So uh, we thought it would be a very difficult task, but it was not so. Uh, so we, we mainly use Zoom platform for most of the online training. And then for troubleshooting, we had to use remote, remote desktop software like uh, TeamWeaver. So these kind of tools, which we didn't use much before, especially to uh, provide end user support and training, we had to use uh, during the COVID-19 era. And of course, the, I must definitely highlight the multi-sector collaboration because this was not just a task possible with health ministry or the history Lanka. There were a lot of parties, uh, the government entities, as well as uh, the private sector and the freelance volunteers, as well as the health staff who were always, all, uh, always there to support the information system. So I would just uh, stop here, but I must really thank the health staff of Sri Lanka without whom this would never have been a success. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks very much, Pamod. Um, take it on from Pamod uh, to also again share experience um, from COVID uh, response uh, with support of DHIS2. Uh, this is a presentation from Uganda, uh, HISP Uganda. 
uh, appreciation to the team uh, behind the COVID response support at HISP Uganda. As Pamud and uh, Rebecca have shared, uh, Uganda has not been also left behind in the in the COVID response. Uh, my background picture is uh, is uh, at the border of um, of Uganda, where we did emphasize uh, use of DHIS to uh, for COVID response. Um, for Uganda, I'm mostly going to focus on uh, our approach to, to all this. Our approach has main, was mainly uh, to help with the data collection at source and be able to visualize. And so is the map I'm share, is the dashboard I'm sharing uh, here that um, Rebecca has uh, highlighted uh, before as um, a local innovation to be able to support the COVID response. So what you see here as uh, from our development server is, um, is a replica of what is currently being used at the command center to be able to respond to the response. And what it does is it allows to bring data from different sources, from different tools uh, that is all uh, reposted into DHIS2 and display. And particularly what you'll be able to see that, you know, the high level visuals that uh, really uh, allow the decision makers to be able to take a decision on where and how the outbreak is, is, is progressing and what measures need to be controlled. And you'll also be able to see that we have, we do support quite a number of pillars uh, in the in the COVID response, for example, you know, have the laboratory, you have the surveillance, you have the case management and logistics dashboards, and again, you also um, our point of care, point of entries have been our most focused, and we're about to see data scrolling down and showing the different data from the different uh, points of entry. So this attempt is to really um, to bring almost near to real data presentation at the high level senior management for COVID response. So our journey started uh, way by looking at what the preparedness in terms of data management, in terms of data transmission, in terms of data collection were laid out by the ICT uh, COVID response pillar. So you will see that uh, this picture or this diagram of flow uh, shows um, the different sources and how data is exchanged and interlinked with the different uh, response pillars and also visualize it. So uh, here I will highlight more um, where the, the DHIS2 has played a key role in terms of uh, uh, capturing data and also in terms of being able to visualize. So one of the key areas in, the, in this COVID response was the self-reporting or the reporting from the community. And, and that was through the rumors, alerts, and um, and signals as many, many of you may, may know them as. So particularly at this point, our DHIS2 allows us to receive uh, SMSs from anonymous users. And for particularly for Uganda, the system was being configured to be able to allow community Ugandans be able to send um, notification to the central team to be able to follow up. So at this point, the DHIS2 again was configured to allow that uh, messages around COVID uh, symptoms, COVID suspects would be reported by the, by the community. And this also worked alongside with other tools that were put in place. Another area that was key to uh, COVID, that is very key to COVID response is the, the different sources where this data is, is, is coming from, where the suspects are. And uh, particularly for this, uh, we're looking at the points of entry, which are our, our borders and airports, the health facilities um, where the patients would have contacts, and the community plus the quarantine centers for those who are probably have been exposed, and the isolation center for those who are positive. And at this point, we were able to reconfigure our EIDS, as we call it, the EHIS to tracker to be able to support uh, the investigation at this point. The other key area that we also have supported with the DHIS2 is the investigation and outcome in the isolation centers. Uh, over, the, over here, you will be able to see that um, uh, for all the isolated cases, in, uh, data is collected from these cases, aggregate and individual level, and the DHIS2 has been configured to be able to support that. And lastly, we were also able to allow the DHIS to uh, visualize this data integrated from the different systems 
and so the dashboard I shared. Uh, as Pambod shared, uh, when everything shut down of, well, for Uganda, the borders did not shut down because we highly depend on imports through load, by load from Tanzania and, the, and uh, Kenya. So uh, in the picture here is uh, one of our busy points of entry where we deployed the DHIS2 Android tracker to be able to capture information real time from the travelers. So at this point, this the tracker is where we really uh, um, started from in terms of our, our COVID response implementation. And slowly by slowly, we've been able to reconfigure our tracker to support uh, investigations at the health facility, community quarantine centers, and the isolation room. And purely here, we, we use the Android um, uh, DHIS tool to be able to collect data in real time. The alerta notification uh, process, of course, continued uh, where um, the command center and the teams responsible for follow-up were able to follow up the the, 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 the notifications or rumors that were coming through the system. Again, um, at the points of entry and this point, we are able to collect all the information that from the travelers regarding their biodata, regarding their travel history, signs and symptoms, and automatically integrated with the lab information management system so that we'll be able to reduce the lab, the, 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 the results turnaround time. And over time, the East African has also developed a, 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 a track driver tracking system that we've also been able to integrate our EIDSR with. And then also for the community, uh, the, the module has also been configured to allow for uh, investigations within the community and also the returning uh, Ugandans who were in abroad. Uh, during the in the beginning of the of the of the of the COVID in Uganda at the borders, um, we had a we had a process that would allow a truck driver uh, be, be 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 sampled, and after sampled, he would be allowed to travel. And once the results have come back, then we would have to locate where the driver is so that we can be able to either isolate them or give them their results. In case they are positive, then they will be isolated. So we did uh, develop a tracker app, uh, DHIS2 um, integrated, that allowed us to be able to scan the QR code for this driver on different checkpoints so that we were able to identify whenever the results uh, were received, we would be able to identify the point at which this uh, driver would be. And here we use the GPS coordinates of the scanning points so that we can be able to locate uh, where the, the, the traveler was. And this would give us the point and the time when the driver would be at that station. Uh, slowly with the, with, the, with the outbreak now shifting to more of uh, more numbers and then getting to more aggregate cases, and also being able to expand to more, more COVID treatment units, we have also remodified our imp imp implementation to be able to support um, investigations and outcomes within the treatment site. And at this point, we are able to capture the details of all the patients who are in isolation and then also at, at, at admission, but and also during admission and also at, at, at discharge. Uh, the DHIS2 has slowly become the central repository for data uh, from different systems. So now it serves as a hub for when data is supposed to be analyzed and picked into other systems or analyzed and also displayed on the dashboard as we've shared. Uh, in terms of visualization, we use a combination of visuals. We do have, uh, of course, the core DHIS2 dashboards that do help mostly at the implementation sites for the, for the teams to be able to appreciate their data and see the progress and also be able to identify some of the challenges they have with the, the, the response. Uh, over here, we are moving now towards um, uh, a tool built on the same dashboard to help the, the command center to be able to narrow down and drill down to the individual, the individual level. For example, for in any given C, uh, uh, CTU, which is a COVID treatment unit, we are able to see the cumulative numbers in admissions and death and, 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 and more information. And also we're able to drill down and be able to see individual level data, patient, uh, that, 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 uh, 
for the patient. So at this point, once you click on the, on the view cases, you are able to drill down and see the individual data uh, in, a, in, a, in a line list, but also as an individual patient chart. And lastly, in terms of the achievements we've done, we've been able to uh, create a repository for COVID data. And as you, as, as, I, as you can see here, we have quite a number of data sources and data sets that have been created in both at the individual level and aggregate level that are currently being updated routinely either by direct import of the data into the system or direct entry of the data into the system, but also using exchange from other systems, especially the lab and ODK. Uh, with that, I, I, I come to the end of my presentation and I wish to appreciate the teams that have been supporting this implementation. Not to not forget Ministry of Health that uh, is at the forefront of this response and utilizing the data from the system to be able to make decisions and uh, manage the, the outbreak. Funding from CDC through uh, infectious disease control that supported the development of these pieces and the rollout of the of the system to make many uh, points of entry, but also supporting the team that has been uh, supporting the Ministry of Health to build the dashboard and not forgetting the HISP team that has worked tirelessly day and night to make sure that they, we, are, we are keeping the team informed of what is happening in the field. Thank you very much.